Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, so I'm actually going to try to cover a couple of things today, um, some with some slides and some with just uh, talking to you. But I wanted to, last time I was here, I wasn't able to get this uh, slide presentation called up. I apologize about that. But I do want to uh, go over a couple of these clinical trials. Um, I, I, they're just so essential um, for glaucoma management this day these days, and I wanted to cover specifically um, the ones that are in the uh, basic science book. This is the new glaucoma book. It's revised this year, and um, you know, it looks to be pretty good. And uh, again, the glaucoma book's pretty small and uh, easy to get through, and uh, you know, I think what you need to know for, not only for OCAPs and boards, but uh, just you know, you're kind of managing the clinic is really, this is a pretty good book. I think they do a really good job on the glaucoma section. <coughs> Pardon me. And, uh, you know, it is my experience, both when I was uh, taking boards and OCAPs and things like that at, at your uh, guide stage, but then also um, I just went through my 10-year uh, board recertification over the past couple of years, so I've been taking all of the, you know, the, the recertification exams, including now, you know, you have a regular uh, uh, test, uh, you know, a proctored test, just like you guys have to do. And, um, the things on those exams really are out of these books very much, and especially um, if you find things highlighted in a table, uh, almost for sure you're going to be tested on that in some way. And um, in the section on open angle glaucoma, there are four of the clinical trials mentioned specifically in that uh, section. And I just thought I'd go over those four clinical trials. And the four that they talk about, they talk about Aegis is one, and SIGITS, and the Early Manifest Glaucoma Treatment Trial, and the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Trial, those four. So just going to say a couple of things about, about, uh, about those. So the Aegis study um, is one of the older studies, and I was just looking here. The recruitment for the Aegis study took place between 1988 and 1992. So you know, the recruitment was quite some time ago. And these are people with advanced glaucoma. And it's a big study. There were over 700 eyes, a very good study, very rigorous follow-up, a very specific entry criteria. But again, these were people already with what was considered advanced disease. And the initial uh, reason for the trial is something that now we would, wouldn't really do. But they were interested at that time about a sequence of treatment. And when you had to treat these people with multiple procedures, which we all do, you know, what was the best sequence? Was it to do a trabeculoplasty first followed by a couple of trabs or to do a trab and then ALT afterwards and then do a trab. Now again, that, that's not something that we would do these days, but back in the day when we didn't have all that many options, uh, that was so, uh, something to be considered. And um, in your book right here, right in this uh, table that is on page 114, they list, the one thing about this study is there are multiple reports that can, have come out of this study. It's an incredibly well-described and, and uh, rigorously followed cohort that's been going on now for you know, 10, 15 years. And you know, they're still uh, publishing some papers from it. And they've listed here, they've highlighted 14 different publications, all right? But the one that gets all the attention, it really, is this Ages Report number seven. And that is one that's highlighted right here. And what Ages Report seven indicated was this, this following right here, that if you looked at this group, and they had divided them up into what they called the predictive analysis and the associative analysis. The predictive analysis was just trying to look at, if you were to follow very carefully what happened in that group for the first 18 months, would that be predictive for what would happen to this group long term? And then the second was just to look at the long term follow up for those fake patients. So in the predictive analysis, what they did is that they divided these patients by their intraocular pressure. So they would go through that uh, treatment sequence and then they would monitor their pressure and they divided them up into those patients that always had a pressure less than 14, those that were between 14 and 17, and those that were above 17, all right? And then in the associative analysis, the report, this age report seven came out after six years of follow-up and those groups were divided, again, based on their intraocular pressure, and it was a, a percentage. The number of visits with an IOP less than 18, was it always less than 18? Was it less than 18, you know, 75% of the time, 50% of the time, or less than 50%? 
So those are the four groups that they followed. And again, they were all divided up strictly by intraocular pressure, all right? So in that predictive group, you know, does what happened in the first 18 months predict what happens after six years? They found the following, that eyes with pressure greater than 17 had more visual field worsening than those with a pressure less than 14. And the amount of worsening kind of continued. So that early worsening based on intraocular pressure, it, it was somewhat predictive in that it just kept getting worse in that group that was above 18, or above 17, sorry. Now, in this day and age now, I mean, my gosh, it's getting almost 20 years now since this stuff was published. I can't believe that, but it, but it is. You know, to, to you guys, that all might just be second nature. Well, of course it is. The pressure's higher and it's getting worse. But understand that at the time that all these tests that we're going to go over today were getting recruited and uh, the, the studies initiated, we just really didn't have that kind of information about does lowering the pressure really make a difference uh, in terms of pressure lowering? And, and you might think that's crazy, but it really was the case, okay? So the next one was this associative analysis, and, and that is just looking at these patients after six years of follow-up, divided up based on what their intraocular pressure was at every visit. And did that predict, you know, how did they do? And what they found that eyes with a pressure less than 18, you know, that was one of the categories, less than 18 was the cutoff, 100% of the time, all visits, so this is this group that every time they came in, their pressure was less than 18. Even in advanced disease, they had almost zero visual field progression. And in that group, the, the average pressure was about 12.8, okay? So the one thing about this study that gets quoted a lot, and that's where a lot of people have in their mind, you gotta get the pressure to 12, okay? And it's based on this study right here. Now, it really didn't say that. What it didn't say get the pressure to 12. It said get the pressure less than 18 at all visits. And that really makes a difference, okay? It's just that the average of that group was 12. And that's pretty remarkable. And that was remarkable data for us to, to see that even in advanced disease, that those patients with the pressure less than 18 all the time did amazingly well uh, over the six year follow up period. And then conversely, eyes with less than 50% of visits with IOP less than 18. So half the time their pressure was 18 or above. They had pretty significant visual field progression that was greater at seven years than two years. And that was you know, what the predictive analysis said. It just kept on progressing during that time, okay? So <clears throat> that's the AGES study. The Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study mentioned specifically in your book. So that's one we ought to know. This is another one, the Collaborative Initial Glaucoma Treatment Study, or the SIGIT study. Again, it's been going on for a long time. And this one was recruited, uh, let me just get the dates exactly here for you. This one was recruited between 1993 and 1997. This was, came in response to a study that was published out of Moorfields in, in England at the time that I was a resident. So it was published about 1992, 1993, this Moorfields study that just took patients that were just diagnosed with glaucoma, first diagnosis, and they randomized them either to surgery or medicine. Or, uh, and uh, they found that the surgery group, the trabeculectomy group, was better. Now, I, we'll talk about that study. I have it in my slides, but it's not mentioned specifically in your book. But, you know, the, that was a good study, but it, it wasn't done with kind of the size and rigor and the follow-up criteria that kind of one of these large NIH sponsored studies, like the, like the AGES study we just went over. It, it, it wasn't in that same kind of rigor. So in 1993, very shortly after that um, Moorfield study was published, this American consortium got together uh, you know, to, to really do one of these big NIH kind of type studies. And it started recruitment in 1993 and ended you know, about four years later and then followed. And what this was, is that, again, a lot of patients, 607 patients, very rigorous entry criteria and progression criteria and all of that. They were randomized either to medicine first or trabeculectomy, okay? And um, the one thing about this study that is important uh, relative to other studies is that um, this was one study where they allowed the uh, treating physician to titrate up the uh, use of medicines, 
okay? And also, it's one of the very few studies of these big trials that allowed prostaglandins, which, you know, they come out now, right? They were available. And, uh, you know, of course, that prostaglandins have revolutionized medical management of glaucoma. So the, one of the most important things in this uh, study right here, and it's actually mentioned specifically in the book, in your table here, is that in both arms of this study, there was really very significant pressure lowering. In the surgery group, it was 48%, and in the, but in the medical group, it was, all, it was 35% also. So both of these groups had a lot of pressure lowering. And what was found is that in both groups even, uh, in the this is an initial publication, that over five years, the five-year data was the first published data, that, almost, that both groups had virtually no visual field progression. Um, the, there was greater acuity loss in the surgical group at first, but then it kind of evened out over time. There absolutely was more cataract surgery required afterwards in the surgical group, okay? And, and the kind of the conclusion of that five-year study was that the present data did not support altering the current treatment regimen, which is most, for most of us is to start with medicines, okay? All right? Now, subsequent to that initial, this is mostly the five-year data. Subsequent to that, uh, there's been a couple of other reports that have come out from the SIGI study, uh, <coughs> pardon me, that are mentioned again specifically in your table here. And one of the things it said is that, um, that if the visual field loss was great at the time of diagnosis, so they had pretty severe glaucoma right at the time of diagnosis, in that group, those that got surgery first maybe did a little bit better, okay? It's not like whoppingly better, but, but there is an argument for going to surgery early if the initial diagnosis is very advanced, okay? All right, so that's the SIGIT study, another very important one uh, to know. Another one, again, mentioned specifically in your book here is the Early Manifest Glaucoma Treatment Trial, okay? Uh, now, this was a study that was randomized again between 93 and 97. And it, yeah, I, I've, I'm always interested in this one because this is a NIH sponsored study that was done in Sweden. And you know, basically, the, the, the reason was is that it, it would never get through an IRB really here in the United States. Because already by this time, there was mounting data that treatment of glaucoma was beneficial. To lower the pressure really made it. Okay. And, but what this uh, study did is that 255 patients, they had early glaucoma. They, they met all the uh, you know, diagnostic criteria of having glaucoma. And part of them were randomized to no treatment. That's the part that you really could, you know, and there's no way this study would, you know, be done today, right? You're going to randomize glaucoma arm to no treatment. But that's what they were. And then the treatment arm got... Uh, trabeculoplasty plus, plus betaxolol, you know, by definition, that, that's what they got, okay? They had very rigorous endpoint, they had six years of follow-up, and they had, you know, good retention in the study. And this study found that um, those that were treated, now the, the, one of the differences between this group and the, uh, the SIGIT study is that in the treatment arm here, it was just ALT and betaxolol. And so the pressure lowering was only about 20, maybe 25%, but it was more like about 20%, okay? So it didn't have that great big 35% pressure lowering that the SIGI study had. But in this group, that pr progression was less frequent in the treated group. But notice that there was a fair amount of progression in both groups, okay? You know, 45% and 62%. So both groups kind of progressed. And so, you know, this is one where we looked at, yes, treatment made a difference but um, there was still a fair amount of progression, and, and especially compared to the SIGIT study, and everyone believed it's mostly due to just the lack of uh, more aggressive pressure lowering, okay? But again, one of the definitive studies that shows that lowering pressure was beneficial, okay? So another very important thing. Now, the last study I, <coughs> I wanted to, uh, to uh, go over, and I'm just gonna talk about this one real quickly, is the ocular hypertensive treatment study. That's the fourth study that's mentioned in your book, okay? So the OATS study uh, is one that uh, randomized patients between 1994 and 1996. Uh, 
1,650 patients, so I mean a lot of patients, all right? And again, these patients, the difference from this trial is that these patients did not have glaucoma. By definition, they had ocular hypertension. They had high pressure, but they had normal fields, normal nerves, okay? And they were randomized to either treatment or no treatment, okay? And again, in this study, the treatment arm uh, the treatment arm only reduced pressure by about 20%. Right? And in this, in this uh, study, the, uh, the two groups, as they were followed over a five-year period, got the five-year data, um, the uh, rate of progression was decreased in those that were treated. And it was decreased by about half. The, those that were untreated, about 10% progressed. So not that many, it's interesting, not that many. 10% progressed to manifest glaucoma over five years, and in the treated arm, about 5%. The actual numbers are 4.4 versus 9.5, okay, at five year follow-up. So that's where this idea comes, and this, you, know, you hear this out there a lot, that treatment of ocular hypertension reduces the risk of glaucoma by about 50%, okay? The other very important things that came out of the uh, OATS study that are listed right here, um, is that um, the, I, the importance of doing pachymetry. All of that came out of the OAT study. In fact, that actually came out as the number one kind of you know, risk factor, uh, even more than intraocular pressure, which is amazing. So they, all of the importance that we have, uh, pachymetry, and it is incredibly important, pachymetry. I, I use that on almost every patient where I'm gonna make a decision about treatment. I look at their pachymetry, you know? And that all came out of the OAT study. Right? So that's very, very important. And then finally, uh, another thing that came out of the OAT study is that after, so once you watch these patients, okay, and then restart them. So this observation arm, uh, and especially those that progressed, they were taken out of the study and they were treated, okay? So the, the question is, is, well, did delaying treatment over that period of time in the end make things worse? Okay, and the answer is it did not, okay? So, let me just read what it says right here. The primary purpose of the follow-up study was to determine whether delaying treatment resulted in a persistently increased risk of conversion to glaucoma, even after the initi initiation of therapy. Although the two groups diverged with respect to the development of glaucoma during the original study period, there was no further divergence in the follow-up. So the idea being that those curves kind of stayed the same. Um, and so delaying treatment until glaucoma was actually manifest didn't make the endpoint worse. You understand what I'm saying there? So just for just watching those people with ocular hypertension uh, didn't it, uh, worsen their prognosis long term. So the, 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 the idea being is that you know, if someone has truly ocular hypertension, uh, we still watch them long. And then the final thing about the OAT study that's very important is that's where this whole idea about risk stratification came to ophthalmology. You know, like people have been stratifying patients relative to heart disease forever, you know, you, their age, their weight, blood pressure, et cetera. And we can now take, what you know what the four factors are? Their age, their initial cup to disc ratio, their initial visual field parameter, and their pachymetry and pressure. They, they factor all those in, and you can basically spit out an equation kind of allows you to assess risk, you know, their risk of developing glaucoma, all right? And, you know, there's those risk calculators. They, 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 got, they were kind of popular for a while, and I don't think people necessarily, I don't, I don't generate numbers now, you can. You can, you can type in those variables for every patient, I don't do that. But I do have in my mind, very definitely, kind of what I call, if you remember this original graph, it's kind of the upper left and down and right. And the upper left, are the higher risk people. So what are the higher risk people that have ocular hypertension? They're older, they have a higher cup to disc ratio at the start, and they have thinner pachymetry. And then of course, if their pressure is higher. So, you know, if you take somebody that has a pressure of 26, and their initial cup to disc ratio is 0.6, and um, uh, their pachymetry is 480, I mean, that person, their five-year risk of developing glaucoma is 40% because you know, they have a 
higher cup to disc ratio, thinner pitching will treat a little higher pressure. But on the other hand, you take somebody with a pressure of 24, they're a little younger, and their cup to disc is like 0.2, and their pachymetry is 580, I mean, their, their risk is 5%. So I kind of just separated them in that. The upper left group is higher cup to disc ratio at the start, thinner pachymetry, higher pressure. And this group down here that has very low risk is lower pressure to start, smaller cup to disc ratio to start, and thicker pachymetry. Okay, so any questions about those? Again, those are right out of the book, and so they're important. I promise you, they're important, all right? Okay, very good. So thanks for letting me catch up there. I'm going to actually turn the lights on right now and just talk to you about some things here uh, about medical management of glaucoma. So medical management of glaucoma, again, the idea of treating with medicines is get the pressure down. And just a couple of kind of basic factors, basic things about that. So... When you're looking to start treatment, um, I think that you, you basically are thinking about a 20% pressure loan, okay? And, and especially with prostaglandins, you, you almost count on getting a 20% pressure loan to start with. And if you don't get a 20% pressure, pressure loan, just, just kind of in your own mind, you, that maybe I would try a different drug, okay? So, some of the basic tenets of, of starting therapy are you're going to look at risk profile, you're going to kind of you know, weigh out the side effects in your mind, but quite honestly, most of the time these days, you're going to pull a prostaglandin off the shelf as the first line of treatment. And you're looking to get at least a 20% pressure loss with that, that drug. And thankfully, most of the time you do. Um, and then, of course, you're going to look at tolerability and how well the patient's doing. Okay? And then you might have to step it up from there. Um, but that's kind of what we're looking for. And so the key to this chapter in your book, um, and what it, and it's not just not just for taking note caps, but just the practice of the medical management of glaucoma, the key is this table right here, okay? And uh, this table is what dominates this section. The entire section of the, bo of the book is basically just a narrative of this table. And I always want to concentrate on this table because I know when I took my own boards, there, there were like three, count them, three questions on this drug called Deridine. And I thought, what the heck is Deridine, you know? I had really never even heard of it. And, and, uh, and then I went back, and because I remember, I said, what, I'm going to look up Deridine. And Deridine was just one drug that was just mentioned in this table. And that's kind of the only place it was mentioned, and yet there were like three questions actual boards uh, about Deridine. So I, and I will guarantee you, and then, like I say, I've just taken the recertification and all of the medical, uh, you know, medical management glaucoma questions basically came right out of this table. So the, in the new book, the table is on page 171. And so what I want to do uh, for the remainder of our time together today is just kind of go through some of the key points of this table with you, okay? And basically what the table is, is it just outlines the various drug classes, uh, all this, all of the you know available drugs within that class, uh, you know basic things about side effects, profile, expected efficacy, that kind of thing. Okay, and it divides them up by drug classes. So when you think of the the pharmacologic agents of glaucoma, you know you divide them up in our mind by drug class, right? And we just have them kind of associated in our mind of you know what's the risk profile of that drug class, and then what might be the best ones to choose. And, and uh, quite frankly and honestly, a lot of what you do within that drug class will depend on the patient's insurance and what's covered and what's not covered. You, you hate to make decisions based on that, but we do it all the time, all right? Um, and so there's some practical realities of it, but most of it is just kind of thinking of a drug class, you know, what's the expected efficacy of that class, what adds together well, right? Because that's about knowing the mechanism of action and why X drug might work with another, you know, things like that. So let's go over a few things and, and we'll, we'll go over together. So the, the way they have them divided up, I think really uh, in order is not alphabetical, but in the order that they are most used, quite frankly. So the first class is the prostaglandin analogs, okay? Prostaglandin analogs, uh, so Zalatan was the initial prostaglandin analog that came out came out when I was a resident, so about 1993, 1994, uh, Zalatan, and it was revolutionary in its, in its uniqueness and 
I, I'd love to, you know, I, I'd love to talk to you about the the, the history of the development of Dalatina. It's it's a it's a fantastic story. It's, it's maybe one of the best stories of drug development anywhere in medicine. The collaboration between academia and and you know pharma and you know the big drug companies. It, it's really remarkable, and the biochemistry of it is absolutely remarkable. You know, this prostaglandin F two alpha, which is a, a, a naturally occurring prostanoid. Uh, you know, from the 1970s, uh, we knew that you could give that drug to somebody and it would dramatically lower the pressure, but the side effect profile was just too dramatic. And so, you know, these scientists, especially ones back in Columbia, Vito back in Columbia, working with pharma, just basically spent years kind of separating the side effects from the efficacy of the drug and then, and then went through all of the different molecules and came up with Zalatia. And um, it, it's just fantastic, you know. It's, it, its side effect profile is so mild, and its efficacy is so great, and it's really a great story. And um, so it was, it was uh, released in 1993, and like I said, just we, we didn't know what to think of it. It was just so different and new. But gradually, as we started to use it and then use it in patients, we said, "Oh my gosh, this is fantastic!" You know, relative to the other drugs that had been that we had available. And so it's really remarkable. And then you look at the others, you know, the others that came after, and there's always the Me Too drugs, right? Zalatan was the main one, and then came Travitan, then came Lumitan, Lumitan again, which represent different companies. And that's kind of how it works sometimes. Travitan is Alcon, and Lumitan is Allergan, and Zalatan is Pharmacia. And um, Zalatan is so unique. And it was so revolutionary that it was given, I, I think, it just went, you know, it just went off patent a while ago. It was given like a 17-year patent. Now, to get a 17-year patent, I mean, it's got to be something remarkable in terms of how unique it is, right? And, and that was unheard of, to get a 17-year patent. And so these other drugs that came out, Travacan and Lumigan, um, you look at the difference in those, just look at them biochemically, and what the, what the, uh, uh, the, the Zalatan developers found that the main, the main side effect was this redness and hyperemia, okay? And they modified the drug, but what they found is that there was one double bond, I think it's like carbon-14 or something like that, there was one double bond that if they saturated that, that out, that took away like 90 plus percent of the redness, okay? Well, Travitan and Lumigan, right, we all know they cause a lot more redness than especially brand name Zalatan. And the reason is, is that they still got that double bond in their molecule because to take it away would infringe on patent, right? So they had to leave that in there. And it, it, so it very simply explains why Travitan and Lumigan cause a lot more redness than Zalatan, the regular Zalatan does, that one double bond. Okay? So it's really, really interesting just from a biochemical standpoint. So what are the, what are the main drugs that you use that are in the prostaglandin category? We'll do, what are the generic? There's latanoprost. What are the others? Catoprost, bimatoprost, right? And then we have one other, which is what is that? Topoprost. Yeah, the, the zyoplatan drug, you know, preservative free. Okay. So when you think of those drugs, what are the what are the main advantages of the prostaglandin drugs that you that you, you you have in your mind? Dosing. Dosing is huge. Once a day. It was it was the first truly once a day drug that we had. And that's remarkable. Okay, so dosing is huge. What are the, what are the other advantages of those drugs? And I hope you lower any efficacy. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing else like it. As, as a single agent, uh, it, it is not uncommon with those drugs to get 30%, 35% pressure lowering um, from a single agent. And the clinical trials that I was showing you there, they substantiate that dramatically. Of all those clinical trials, and we could talk about the normal tension level in the treatment trial in addition. Again, that's not mentioned in the report, but it's a huge trial. The only trial that allowed the use of prostaglandins was that SIGIT study, and it was the only one that had 35% pressure lowering in the medicine group. Nothing else even came close to that. They're all around 20%. So efficacy is tremendous. Uh, so dosing, fantastic. Efficacy, fantastic. It, what are the other advantages? Yeah, tolerability. Yeah, you know, really, really pretty exceptional, especially with the old brand name Zalatan. You know, they, they tend to be comfortable. 
so uh, and, and well tolerated. So when you think of side effects and issues and issues that come to your mind, what are the issues and side effect issues? Iris change, right? Flashes. Flashes is almost universal, okay? And uh, you know, the uh, eye color change, uh, it happens. I, I think it's, it was overstated initially, and it hasn't seemed to be a problem. You know, we've been using these drugs forever. Um, with the eyes that the eyes that really are the ones that are most susceptible to a color change, I think, are kind of this kind of brownish green color, going darker. A, a, Straight blue eye, I, I don't think I've ever seen that effective. I've seen a, 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 a kind of a brownish eye be made more brown, and especially kind of this brown green color. I think that's the one that's more effective. But a dark, dark brown eye seldom gets darker, and a blue eye, I don't think I've ever seen a blue eye change nor heard of one. Maybe, maybe there is. I'm sure you can find some report, but blue eyes are usually left alone. But it is real. What are some of the other things? More recently, what's been described with the prostate Skin darkening, definitely. Yeah, the orbital fat thing. Now that's one that we missed as I mean as a profession for quite a long time. And 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 when someone you know finally kind of brought it to everyone's attention and we started looking for it, you went, yeah, that, that is real. You know, kind of that orbital fat and that loss of volume in the orbit, it, it, that's that's very real. Okay, so so those are the things we think about as side effects. They are great drugs. They, they truly have revolutionized the medical treatment of glaucoma. Uh, the number of trabeculectomies uh, that performed in the United States, you can just look at it. Since 1993, and, and, and you know, before all these other surgeries came in, it, there was actually there's a, just significant decline. Uh, and it was the introduction of the prostaglandin drugs. They do have some side effects, but most times already. What are some of the other things that are mentioned about exacerbation of iritis? You know, CME. Um, I think those things are probably real, but they are overstated. Okay. What I mean by that is, uh, if I'm dealing with a uveitic patient, and and it might be that, that that might be one group of patients where a prostaglandin might not be the first drug I pull off the shelf for them. But if if it's if I'm looking at doing surgery or starting a prostaglandin, absolutely I'm going to start the prostaglandin in even the worst uveitic uh, before I slap a tube in. You know, so and and I've, I've found that it almost never exacerbates uh, their their iritis or their CME. But but it is something we have in mind. It, and if we're if we have a patient that has chronic CME or you know a retina patient or something like that, and they're on a prostaglandin, I'll I'll try taking them off of it. You know, to see if it makes a difference. All right. But excellent drugs. Uh, the uh, Lumigan or Bimatoprost. You know, that is a drug that all of those side effects that I mentioned, lash growth, darkening, skin darkening, redness, those are all worse with Lumigan, uh, and it's probably just a straight concentration issue. I mean, you look at the concentration issue, the concentration of Lumigan versus the others, it's an entire order of magnitude greater than uh, the others, okay? So I think it's just uh, a straight uh, concentration issue. The preservative-free, the Zyoptan, um, you know, I think that has real benefit. Uh, there are lots of, you know, we know, we know that. There are lots of people that don't tolerate benzalkonium chloride. And so I, I use, end up using Zyoptin quite a bit. And the problem is it's expensive, okay? And it's not usually covered by insurance. So latanoprost is now generic. And, you know, I, I do think that there is some difference of efficacy sometimes in the generic latanoprost. I think that, uh, I, I wish that weren't the case. I think part of the problem and, you know, I think right now there are like nine manufacturers of generic latanoprost, and you, you never know exactly who you're going to get. But uh, I do think there is potentially some loss of efficacy with the generic latanoprost, but but it's the one that now is that, you know so many insurers insist that you use. There is now a generic travitan. There's a travaprost um, that is out there now that you can you can usually write for as well. Very good. Any questions about prostaglandins? I mean, they are our drug of choice for, for most cases. So let, let me ask you this then. So when you have Travitan and you, you're, or excuse me, one of the prostaglandins, you're, you're using them and you feel like you need to get a little more pressure lowering, um, any thoughts on what you might choose to add 
to uh, the process land is what, what might be your first choice? Or is there a first choice? There's no, there's no always the correct answer. But, uh, uh, you know, I, still, I would say still most of the time, a, a beta blocker, if there's not other con contraindications, might be the one that's added, added next, okay? Uh, so let's talk about those, the beta blockers. And that is indeed the next category. The beta adrenergic agonists, you know, the beta blockers, and they were all referred to as the beta adrenergic antagonists. So beta blockers have been around forever. Timolol, Timoptic was introduced in the 1970s, I think, right at the end of the 1970s. So it's a drug that's been around for a long time, and we know a lot about it just out of use, okay? So what are the non-selective beta blockers? And what is, because that's the main category of the beta blockers, is selective versus non-selective. And, and what's the difference there? What, what are the non-selective beta blockers? They block beta 1 and 2. And the uh, selective block selectively which ones? That's correct. Okay. So the idea is is that the beta twos are mostly are predominant in the lungs, right? So that's where the potential for asthma issues come. And and so betaxolol, which is the the uh, selective beta blocker, uh, is a little less um, blocking the beta twos more selective for the beta ones. And so the idea is that you know you might not have as much asthma exacerbation. You know, with the other drugs that we have available now that are non-beta blocker, betaxolol has really kind of lost its niche. And so I, I, I don't know, but I mean I have very, very few patients on betaxolol, right? Because if I'm going to try to stay away from asthma, I'm just going to kind of use a non-beta blocker altogether. We have other options now. So uh, that's kind of lost its niche. But of the, of the uh, non-selective, the classic one is timolol malmedate, right? That's timoptic. There's timolol hemihydrate, that, the brand name of that, and beta mol for uh, a lot of years. Okay, so there's those two timolol drugs. And then there's an, uh, uh, another couple of non-selective um, uh, uh, beta blockers that still are listed. Levovunilol is one, okay. Metoprolol, or, or excuse me, metoprolol is another, and cartiolol is another. And I mention those because they're still in the in this uh, in this table and therefore testable, even though you probably will never use them. And uh, I, I, I just recently on my board recertification there was a question about cartiolol. So let's talk about those just a little bit. When you think of timolol maliate, the classic non-selective beta blocker, timoptic is its brand name. So in terms of efficacy and dosing, uh, what are some of the things you think about? Let's talk about dosing first. Uh, it's FDA approved as a BID drug, right? But we very often use it as a single day drug. And there's lots of good data to support that. That after you've used uh, the beta blocker, topical beta blockers for a while, you know, the receptors become so saturated that uh, you, know, you can probably use it once a day, okay? And so I use a lot of timolol once a day. But it is true that if you're gonna dose it once a day, when do you need to dose it? In the morning. In the morning, and that's also been very well established data that, that timolol or the beta blockers work best during the day and they don't provide a lot of nighttime coverage. So a, a once a day dosing in the morning is probably pretty effective. And, and I've, you know, over the years I've tried it and you almost get zero bump from adding that, you know, PM dose. So using the Timolol in the morning once a day is usually pretty effective, but the FDA approval is uh, twice a day. In terms of surface or just topical tolerability of the beta blockers, do you think of them as being good or not so good? No. Yeah, the topical. I, I think it's good. I mean, it's, you know, just most people tolerate Timolol from just a topical standpoint. So it's pretty well tolerated, especially just once a day. You might have some allergy itching, you know, you're, you can get that with any drug. Benzalkonium chloride issue is usually the biggest uh, concern. But it's a pretty well tolerated drug from a topical, local standpoint. Of course, the big issue with, with the uh, beta blockers is the systemic part, right? The systemic side effect part. Asthma is the number one, okay? and, and it, it truly is, I think, still contraindicated in anyone with asthma, reactive airway disease, COPD, 
I mean, I just don't do it. All of us, I mean, if you do glaucoma long enough, all of us have had, you know, have been surprised by, um, you know, really making somebody worse or something you didn't know about or something just didn't know somebody had asthma or whatever, and you give them that and, and you you make them really worse in terms of breathing. I think we've all done that, so we know it's very real. So, uh, you know, in my mind, using the beta blockers in that, uh, you know. Uh, group I just don't do, okay? But uh, let me just ask you, what, do you, what, what have you found in using them uh, have been uh, other, uh, other categories of patients that have really struggled uh, with topical beta blockers? Heart block. Yeah, heart block is real, okay? Very definitely, you gotta be careful with that. The, I don't mean if I read my mind, but the, the, other, the other groups that are, are very real, uh, number one is those with depression. You absolutely, absolutely can exacerbate depression with just topical beta blockers, and that's very real. And you know, one thing that I, uh, you know, I, we, we, we try to pay attention always to other drugs that people are on, but uh, when I'm looking about beta blockers, uh, if they're on antidepressants, I, am, I am usually go to a different category of drug. Or the other thing I watch for, especially, is if you've got a uh, patient that you've been treating maybe for a long time on a beta blocker and they come back and they're suddenly now taking an antidepressant, okay, that's a new drug for them. I usually take them off their beta blocker uh, in, in that case. If they've come back on and they've been started by their physician or something on an antidepressant, I usually stop their beta blocker to see. And then the other, uh, the other category that's very real with the beta blocker is, is central that's another, you know, uh, 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 drugs that I watch for, uh, you know, in males especially, you know, if they're taking uh, these erectile dysfunction drugs, I'm very careful with beta blockers, okay, because that, that's another very real thing. So um, they do have their systemic issues. Now, the things you need to know about, there's one thing you need to know about metoprenolol and another about cartiolol because they're just testing questions, okay? And they don't even use these drugs anymore. I, I, I think I have one patient that's on Cartiolol that I still write because he's been on it for 25 years or however long. But what is the difference about Cartiolol? What's the one thing about it that is unique about it? it you know, referring to, they, call, they refer to it as this intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Have you even heard about that? Uh, you know, that there's a little bit of alpha agonist activity of that drug. And so it is felt that it has a little less effect on nocturnal like hypotension, all right, and a little less effect on modifying uh, the lipid profile. Now that's another thing that's very real about the beta blockers. It can adversely affect uh, the cardiac lipid profile of patients, and that's, there's good data to support that. Cartiolol is felt to have a little less than that and a little less effect on nocturnal uh, hypotension. Let me just read what they say exactly for cartiolol may have less effect on nocturnal pulse blood pressure. You know. So there, there's, the, there's the trivia, test, testing trivia about Cartiolol, all right? And then there's one testing trivia about metoprenolol. Because uvitis. Yeah, because it, it's been associated initially with uveitis, and it probably was the carrier, actually, that uh, was the problem, which has since been rectified, but we don't write for the drug anyway, but you know, there it is on the table, and there is the little question there, report of iritis, okay? So there's the little trivia of that, all right? Now, then, to just say a word, then, about the selective betaxolol, um, you know, lower risk of pulmonary complications, that's its only, the only reason why it was even brought to market to begin with. It has, I think the only thing you need to know about it, it is truly less efficacious than the non-selective. It lowers pressure less than Timolol does, okay? But man, we Okay, very good, so that's the beta blockers. The next category of drugs that are listed here are the alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, okay? The alpha-2, and that mostly consists of two main drugs in that alpha-2 agonist group, and wh which are those? Which one? Bermondine's one, absolutely. And apoclonamine's the other. So these drugs came out just prior to the release of Zalatan, just, just prior, okay? So they were one of the very 
first drugs that got released, approved by the FDA, that were not a beta blocker. Okay, so you know, when I started my residency, so 1991, when I started my residency, even then, believe it or not, we had Timolol, epinephrine derivatives, okay, pilocarpine, and oral dialects. That's that's what we had. Those were the only drugs we had. So it's just in my you know professional lifetime that these other drugs have been introduced. And the alpha alpha uh, alpha agonists here, these alpha two agonists, were, were in that drug category. It was some of those drugs that were released. They also came out when I came out of residency. Acroclonidine and um, alpha-monidine. Now acroclonidine had been released a little bit earlier in its preservative-free form in these little vials for, for the prophylaxis of IOP spikes around anterior segment surgery. So when I first started my residency, we did have these little foil pouches of acroclonidine in a little vial, because it was preservative-free, that we would open up and we would use around laser treatments. And it was revolutionary. It was unbelievable. You know, so I have never lived through the age of pressure spikes after laser treatment. We still see it sometimes. But they used to see it just, just two or three years before I started my residency. They would see it all the time. And these, these drugs were fantastic for that. But those little vials were not uh, available for long-term use, okay? <coughs> so the first drug that was introduced was acroclonidine in a 0.5% concentration in a bottle to be used chronically. And it was a three time a day dosing. And then shortly thereafter, and, and again, you know, the, the drug companies play their, their battles. Apoclonidine is an alcon drug, and then Vermontidine or Alpagan is an Alpagan drug. Okay, that came out, the, the Alpagan came out shortly thereafter. Okay, so when you think of those drugs, what do you think of them in terms of efficacy? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, uh, they work, but it's still on the order. I mean, your book here says 20 to 30 percent. I think the 30 percent is definitely pushing it. Uh, they are more of a, in my mind, more of a 15 to 20 percent kind of pressure level. Okay, but it, they do lower pressure, and and uh, you know I use these drugs all the time, and um, they uh, I think they work. I think they add well to prostaglandins. Okay, and, and you know these days these other drugs. One of their main qualities is how well do they add to a prostaglandin? You know, a beta blocker, it, it might not be that great. You know, it, it's not, one of the reasons we use beta blockers is that they're cheap and they are, you, you can get by with once a day. But they might not be the best addition to uh, uh, a prostaglandin drug, okay? And in fact, the combo drugs of like the Zalcom and those that are available in Europe, uh, combination drug of, of latanoprost and timolol can't get approved here. And I think they've given up. I don't think we'll ever have it here in the United States. And, and the big part of the deal is just the, the additional pressure lowering benefit is not as great as we might hope for. And so, like I said, I, I think the companies have pretty much given up on combining those two drugs, okay? Here in the United States, but they're available but um, the uh, al the, Bermond the uh, alpha two agonists, I think, add pretty well to prostaglandins. And um, what are the issues related to uh, these drugs that are that you think of just in the clinic uh, in terms of tolerability issues concerns? So you're going to get about a you know 15 to 20 percent lowering you hope for. What are the what are the downsides of these drugs? Yeah. That, that's it's allergy. I mean, it's all about allergy. The, uh, any of these agonists or these alpha agonist drugs, you know, epinephrine, you know, falls in that same category. Propene, and, and so like I said, when I say epinephrine, propene is the drug that we had available to us when I was a resident. We almost never use anymore. Allergy is the issue with all these alpha agonists. Allergy is the issue, and it's still the issue with bromonidine. It's allergy. I mean, if you didn't have that out these allergy problems, you would use it, end up using it so much more and for longer. But <coughs> I mean, that alpha gan allergy, the bromonidine allergy, I mean, you can recognize it from across the room as soon as you walk in and look at your patient. You know, well, okay, you're, you're stopping bromonidine today, you know, and, and unfortunately it happens in, in a lot of patients. And I think, I, I truly think that here in this 
very dry environment that we have, that it's even more prevalent than it is. Uh, and I think that was well proven uh, when the brand name drug was out. You know, you would have so much more trouble with it here than say they did in Seattle or something where they had a much more humid climate, okay? So allergy is the whole issue, really. I mean, it's, it's the major issue, okay? But there are a couple of others that are, I think are very important to talk about with particularly Vermontidine, okay? And, and what, what's the main thing about Vermontidine that you don't want to, or who do you, who do you not use Vermontidine in? Children. Absolutely, yeah, children, you know, especially infants. And, and that actually, we, we were the ones here that published that, you know, published that initial kind of warning. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is absolutely real. You will, you, and there have been some reports of putting infants, you know, with, uh, into the into the hospital, but but to certainly sedate them for uh, twelve hours is uh, you know you'll do it. So we don't give don't give that drug to any uh, child. I don't know, and who knows what the cutoff is, but I kind of think something like you know less than eight or something like that. You can make them at least very tired, and an infant is absolutely contraindicated. Not so much so with aquaclonidine, and in fact, it's much less. It just doesn't cross the the blood brain barrier. Alpha-GAN, Vermontidine, definitely, definitely does, okay? Now, the other thing about that, though, is you can see it in the elderly as well, and it's something you need to watch for and ask about, that, uh, you know, you can, you can put an elderly person to sleep with these drugs as well, or make them much more soft. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, I still remember one time an elderly person that started the drug, and about a week later, I got a call from the family that just said, you know, since we started that drug, Grandma has just not gotten out of bed. And all we do is just open her eyes now and put the drop in. She's, she's like, has been asleep since we started that drug. And so it's, it's real, okay? So allergy is a biggie, but this uh, kind of blood brain barrier issue in, in some, especially in infants and the very elderly, is a possibility too. But, you know, I mean, I use a lot of the drug. I, I will say this, um, and I'm, I'm a, you know, a fan of generics and et cetera, but the alpha-gan, the alpha-gan P, okay, brand name alpha-gan P is a way, way, way better drug than generic 0.2% bromonidine. There's less allergy, and the P stands for a different preservative, you know, that pyrite preservative. And so those, the only problem is alpha-gan P, of course, is not covered very well by insurance, so you end up writing for 0.2% bromonidine all the time. But way more allergy, way less tolerated than alpha gan P. That, you know, it, it just irked us all that when Combigan came out, which is an allergan drug, you know, who makes alpha gan P, al uh, Combigan has the 0.2% bromonidine in it. It doesn't have the 0.1% uh, with the pyrite thing. And, and, you know, that's all about money and drug development, unfortunately. But, so, you know, Combigan will give you way more, in my opinion, will give you way more allergy than brand name alpha EMP because of the concentration and the, the lack of different preservatives, okay? All right, very good. So um, the, those covers those, those drugs. Now, this, the next cat major category of topical drug is the uh, topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, okay? And um, so that's another drug. That was the first drug that came out, topical drug, it came out right at the beginning of my residency. Trusopt was the drug. And um, that was the first kind of non-timolol drug that, that came out that was also not epinephrine, okay? So in, in boom, 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 and during the time of my residency, in order, were released Trusopt, Alphagan, Zenzalpine. Okay, all three of those came out you know, 20, how many years ago that is now? 20 plus years ago uh, when I was a resident. And so we had all these drugs. So Trusop was a drug, it's a good drug. And it, and it, was, it, it was really fast tracked through the FDA. The FDA was just cl you know, clamoring, give us a drug other than Timolol that we can get approved because we know we need it, right? And so uh, Trusop was fast tracked. It's topical carbonic content. It was, it, it, we use it and we still use it like crazy, but it, initially it was, it was kind of disappointing because 
it's three time a day dosing. That's the other thing about I wanted to say about uh, Alphagen and, and Bromonidine. Those are truly three time a day drugs. Now we use them a lot twice a day, but they are only approved by the FDA as TID dosing. And there's a very, very definite trough effect uh, if they don't take that midday dose. So uh, unlike you know I said about the beta blockers, adding that PM dose sometimes doesn't do much. That that third dose of of uh, Alphagen or Bromonidine that makes a difference. And the, you know the problem is that that's the hardest one to get in. You know that midday dose is the one so hard to, to get in, just from a compliance standpoint. Uh, but it does make a difference. And the same can be said of uh, dorsolamide. It is truly a TID drug, okay? So uh, that this is another drug that, I, let me see what your book says here. Yeah, it says 15 to 20%, and that's, that, is, that is real. I mean, it's a 15 to 20% additive drug or used by itself. Uh, the, the great thing about Dorsolamide, it, you know, topical carbonic hydrase inhibitors. It, the great thing about it, in my opinion, is the systemic safety profile. I mean, I think it is as safe as we get. I was going to look at what they say here. You know, they they kind of list the, uh, uh, you know, on on a common systemic. Yeah, less likely to induce systemic side effects of carbonic and hydrase inhibitor. Yeah, I mean, like like way less. Uh, compared to oral Dymox, they're like incomparable in terms of side effect profile. Uh, the biggest thing with the dorsolamide is you get kind of a bitter taste. That's, that's probably the biggest thing you'll hear your patients describe. And it is. It, it's pretty much universal. But it's, I, I think, a very safe drug. It is, it is probably my number one drug that I pull off the shelf to treat infants, pregnant women, okay, that, that need to get treatment. I, I, think, I think this is tops, all right? So it's about a 15 to 20% pressure lowering drug. Um, it has a great systemic side effect profile. It stings, no doubt it stings, and um, also it uh, does cause some allergy, absolutely. Okay, not as much as bromonidine, but definitely more than either timolol or the prostaglandins. So your number one allergy drugs, the number one is the epinephrine drugs which you won't even use, propane, okay? Uh, but number one that you'll use is bromonidine in that category, and number two is the carbonic, topical carbonic acid. So those are your number one allergy drugs. Why do I say that? Well, when you have a patient that's taken three drugs and they've got an allergy, and you want to try to find out, stop the bromonidine first, okay? And if that doesn't do it, stop the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and then finally stop something else, right? That's, that's the order you would go in to try to find what they're allergic to. But it's almost always the bromonidine. Very good. So I like the drug. I like these drugs a lot, use them a lot. Um, and then finally, brinzolamide, which is Azot. Okay, Azot, still available, brand named Azot. Uh, unfortunately, very, very expensive now. Uh, so we practically don't use it. But uh, Azot, in terms of comfort, is way better, way better than generic dorzolamide. Um, and it truly is. Uh, it is way, it's much more pH balanced. That's a pH issue. The pH of the azot is much more physiologic, so it just stings less, it's much more comfortable. But it is prohibitively expensive now for most uh, people just because of insurance costs, okay? All right, very good. Any questions about that? So that, I mean, those are the big four, right? You got the prostaglandins, got the beta blockers, got the bromonidine types, the alpha-2 agonists, and then we have the, the topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, okay? Now, in the, in the CAI category, of course, you've got to talk about uh, acetazolamide and methazolamide. Uh, you know, you can't, we, we would spend the rest of the day talking about the side effects of those drugs. They are many. And, uh, you know, there are, most of the time we think of those, I think of those drugs now as kind of temporizing agents. You know, you've got somebody with a, a, an acute glaucoma for some reason, or their pressure's 40 and you're going to take them to the OR in three days or something because that's when you can get in. You, know, you put them on that in the meantime. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're trying to temporize. I do, though, I have more than a few patients who are on this drug chronically for various reasons. Uh, the main one bring, being that they, you know, we feel that their surgical risk is high enough that it's, pro it's worth trying this, and, and the patient understands that. And they think they all have the side effects. Uh, but they, they prefer that versus taking the risk of surgery, and, and I can totally understand that in some cases. 
you know, some of these patients are the ones that have had uh, an adverse outcome of surgery in the other eye, for example, or something like that. You know, when I was a resident, everybody was on Dymox, and so, you know, the glaucoma clinic was the most miserable patient clinic, you know, people felt horrible all the time. And, uh, and we, we knew that, but we just didn't have any other options. But we still pull it off the shelf. I'm surprised how often we still use Dianox uh, for this kind of temporizing kind of category. Um, I will say this, and this is absolutely true. If you are contemplating using uh, one of these drugs for chronic treatment, use methazolamide. It is definitely more tolerable, okay? Again, the problems are it's a little harder to find and it can be more expensive but it is absolutely more tolerable than oral dynamite, there's no question, okay? So if I'm thinking about using this as a, as a chronic drug, I, I try methazolamide, okay? Okay, great. Uh, we're out of time, uh, but again, just refer to your table here about the few remaining drugs, which are the uh, cholinergic agonists, the pilocarpine group, okay? Again, we use them very seldom, we used to use them all the time, very seldom now, but you'll still have a few patients on them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just review those. And then the combo drugs, okay? Uh, Comigan and, uh, and COSOP, I'm using their brand names, of course. And then now uh, some um, So, you know, all of those drugs are good. I think of those drugs, the one I use the most is probably dorsolamitimolol because I think the, the tolerability profile is the best of that one. And I mean, combo drugs, let's be honest, I, uh, I like them a lot. You know, you can be a purist, and I try to be kind of a purist, but there are, there are many times. So here's the thing. So you've added a, you've added a prostaglandin drug, um, and yes, you know, so you're number one, and you got, you know, 20 some percent lowering, but the pressure's still too high, and you still need to lower it. You know, your target's less than 15, and they're starting at 28, and, and you started prostaglandin, and you've got the pressure to, you know, 20, and you think, well, okay, that's a reasonable response, I'll take that, but it's not what I want to be. I've got to have another 25% lowering of, of this pressure. You know, I, I sometimes will, in that instance, I will add a, a combo drug right off. And, you know, I could say the purist would say don't do that, but, you know, the reality is you, you got to get t another 25 to 30% lowering. The chance of getting that with another, any single agent that you have available to you is incredibly low. So, uh, you know, I use a lot of com combo drugs. And you know, in, in that setting, I'll add them right off without stepwising, okay? But most of the time, I still do stepwising. If I, if I need about a 20% lowering, I still add just one drug. I'll add a beta blocker, or I'll add dorsolamide or something by itself, and then go to a combination. But if I still need 25 to 30%, I'll, I'll just go with the combo drug. Dorsolamide Timolol, I like a lot. I think it's well tolerated for the most part. It's cheap. Uh, you know, Combigan is good also, but it's expensive. You know, there's no generic uh, of it yet. Uh, but I, I think that, that drug will come off patent pretty soon because it's just, it's just two generic drugs put together to make a brand name drug. You know, it's, it's, it's drug games. Uh, so because of the fact that it's just already two generics that are available, I don't know when the patent runs out. You know, they usually don't tell you that, but it, it, it won't be very long. So you know, we'll have a, a generic combination Combigan before much longer. And then Sembrinza again, uh, you know, the one thing about Sembrinza is that Sembrinza is matched with Brinzolamide, which is still a brand name drug, so that patent might be a little bit longer. Uh, you know, Sembrinza, I don't use a lot of Sembrinza. Um, it, it's, you know, it's just two drugs that are readily available and you still get all the allergy issues because it's got the 0.2% bromodidine in it. So, and it's very expensive. So I, I, I don't see a lot of use for I, I use it some, but, but not that much. I usually use the separate agents. Okay, I uh, don't want to keep you any longer. Thanks a lot. Have a, have a good day.